Now I leave the floor for Dr. Mohammed Sheif to present his slides. Dr. Mohammed, please. Assalamu uh, alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you uh, for this kind of invitation. Uh, and also, I would like uh, to thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Forja and uh, Dr. Iman for uh, their you know, wonderful presentation. I did enjoy their presentation. And uh, they covered different aspects of thrombosis. Uh, cancer associated thrombosis and the Torah. Uh, Farja covered a very important uh, area, unusual side thrombosis, and she navigated us through a roller coaster uh, kind of patient. So it's very, you know, stormy presentation. So I would like to shift the gear and to take you to a smooth uh, journey uh, of a patient on uh, Duak therapy. Uh, so we'll start without further ado with my uh, highlighting my objectives by the, uh, by the end of this webinar. So, uh, so journey on uh, direct or anticoagulant or dual patient through a different care setting from initial presentation until development of complication. It's going to be discussed in a case-oriented and evidence-based uh, approach. Uh, the latest uh, in regarding VT, VT treatment, uh, we are anticipating the uh, American Society of Hematology uh, clinical practice guideline for VT treatment, uh, 19 pandemia. Uh, I will not talk about clinical trials, just to talk about the practicality of uh, DUACs in clinical uh, practice. Because as you know, there are overwhelming body of uh, evidence uh, of uh, DUOX and BT treatment. Uh, you have for eduxiban, for rivaroxaban, for uh, abixaban, uh, etc. And uh, so often we uh, become so focused and uh, finished mind that we fail to enjoy the journey. So I'm kindly requesting you to enjoy uh, the journey of my uh, uh, when we talk about the most common type of venous thrombosis it accounts for 90 to 95 percent of venous thrombosis and uh, remaining uh, five percent unusual site thrombosis so unusual site thrombosis any venous thrombosis that don't affect the lower limbs or uh, lungs and unusual side thrombosis could be a cerebral vein thrombosis, as the patient, uh, I mean, presented by Dr. Korja. It could be sublanking vein thrombosis, uh, retinal vein, hot KR or hepatic vein thrombosis, and uh, IVC, then vena cava thrombosis, supervena cava thrombosis, and upper extremity uh, DVT. Also, upper extremity is considered unusual side uh, thrombosis. Then part of the sublanking vein thrombosis, we have the mesenteric uh, superior uh, or inferior mesenteric vein, splenic vein, and portal vein thrombosis. Uh, I mean, the, all the clinical trials uh, for uh, DUOX, uh, for venous, approved for venous thromboembolism. So we don't have sufficient evidence for use of DUOX in uh, unusual side thrombosis. However, it's used uh, extensively in the clinical uh, practice of label use. Uh, when we talk about uh, venous thromboembolism or uh, in DVT and PE, so 95, sorry, 25 percent of, so is it the slide moving? So 25 percent, uh, I mean, of symptomatic uh, distal vein thrombosis propagate and extend to the proximal veins, which is the aliofemoral veins. And uh, usually within uh, a week, that's why if a patient presents with typical DVT symptoms uh, with negative Doppler ultrasound, you need to repeat uh, the Doppler ultrasound after five to uh, seven days to make sure the distal DVT extended or propagated to the proximal vein. Once you have proximal DVT, uh, majority of uh, the patient, about 50%, they, uh, you know, embolize to the, to the lung about 50% in spite of absence of chest uh, symptoms. 
So even if they don't have typical chest pain, relative chest pain, short of breath, hemoptysis, cough, or palpitation, if you do a perfusion scan, 50% of them, they have pulmonary embolism. So this is a frequent, you know, yani occurrence of uh, BE in the setting of a proximal uh, DVT. And you can have multiple emboli like this uh, patient, or you can have one single pulmonary large clot detached from the aerofemoral vein and move uh, to block the pulmonary trunk, what we call it massive pulmonary embolism. Luckily, that massive pulmonary embolism or high risk PE occur about 10% of you know, symptomatic uh, PE and can kill uh, the patient within uh, one hour. And 5 to 10% of PE, they can present with a shock, RV shock. Uh, that cause, you know, uh, obstruction of the right uh, ventricle outflow. Uh, very interesting that we have patients that present initially with a BE without DVT. If you screen them with double ultrasound, 70% of them, they have early femoral DVT, I mean, a proximal uh, DVT. And only 25% of them, they have clinical signs of uh, DVT along with the pulmonary embolism. Very interestingly, that some kind of patient, like uh, Bahjet, uh, Bahjet vasculitis, uh, they have pulmonary artery thrombosis, pulmonary uh, embolism uh, that formed in the pulmonary artery. We call it de novo pulmonary embolism or pulmonary artery thrombosis, not embolism, because the formation of clot or BE in the pulmonary artery. I think also there are some evidence saying that COVID-19 uh, you know, uh, is a hypercoagulable state, and they present with uh, BE more than DVT because of the severe inflammation, cytokine storm, uh, you know, uh, syndrome, the endotheliosis uh, or endotheliitis. They have severe inflammation of the endothelium. That's why you, you, they present with BE more than, uh, I mean, uh, DVT. Very interesting that we do see patients that uh, they can have uh, DVT without uh, the presence of a uh, provocation or provoking factor because of the, there is obstruction of the right, uh, I mean, left uh, common uh, iliac vein uh, by crossing the right iliac artery. We call it May Therner syndrome. Also in a pregnancy, because of the gravid uterus, you can see uh, compression on the, what we call May Therner like syndrome. They present with DVT most time in the left leg, about 80% than the right. So this is just to talk about you know, uh, DVT and BE, and you can have uh, DVT that can, you know, embolize from the uh, deep veins and go to the uh, lung. Before going to the lung, coming, uh, you know, through the heart, it can cross from the right atrium to the left uh, atrium and go to cause stroke. We call it paradoxical embolism, and we have seen it. It's not common, but you have to think about it. If you have stroke in young age, you have to do bilateral dubler do echo, you might have patent from an oval or atrial septal defect. So why we treat, uh, I mean, uh, DVT to prevent complication. What are the complications? As we see, this is important. To prevent the embolization to the lung, which is the, this is the most feared uh, complication. Also, it can lead to uh, fatal pulmonary embolism, as I mentioned, in 10% of the cases, one out of 10, they can have fatal pulmonary embolism, die within uh, 60 minutes prevent extension to larger veins, like in the setting of distal veins, it can prevent the extension or propagation, propagation from distal vein to proximal vein. Prevent recurrence, very important sometime after we treat uh, VTE, especially in unprovoked VTE, we keep them an anticoagulation extended period to prevent recurrence, like we call as secondary prevention of uh, venous thromboembolism. Also can kind of prevent uh, or avoid the chronic complication, which is devastating, like post-thrombotic syndrome and the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Post-thrombotic syndrome, more common, about like it can occur uh, about uh, 40 to 50 percent of the cases and can range from mild to moderate and severe, uh, you know, incapacitating disease. The post, uh, I mean, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is to this extent about 5 to 10 uh, percent. So what's the chance, uh, I mean, uh, of recurrence uh, with and without anticoagulant therapy. So if the patient present with uh, proximal DVT, 
and you don't anticoagulate. So about 50%, about 47 to 50%, they will have recurrence. So they will have a recurrence. That's why some patients they present with DBT and they don't seek medical advice. They don't, did not embolize, but they, they don't receive treatment. So you might, you might uh, catch them in the second presentation because they have high risk of, of recurrence. By double ultrasound, you can find out uh, there is chronic thrombosis and acute on top of chronic, you can have, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, I mean, superimposed and chronic DVT, you can have acute one. So if you give anti adequate anticoagulation, you decrease the risk of recurrence to less than 2%. So very effective, about 50%, you know, if you give adequate anticoagulation, uh, you can achieve a remarkable reduction of the risk of recurrence. And usually the highest risk of recurrence is the first month, about 50%. Then the second and third month, about 20%. Uh, Interestingly, DBT, if you have initial presentation of, uh, you know, uh, VT is DBT, usually the recurrence is uh, DBT, and you have, uh, after initial PE, 60% uh, of the recurrences are B. I think the explanation behind these, because of the endothelial damage, residual vein thrombosis in the endothelium, this is a triggering factor for recurrent uh, venous uh, thromboembolism. I think this is important here. Uh, you remember that in the anticoagulation, uh, you know, uh, phase, the acute phase, uh, you can have what we call a fluctuation in the therapeutic uh, range of INR. You can have inadequate anticoagulation because of the overlapping approach, complexity of the uh, anticoagulation approach. I think with the uh, DUAC, it uh, really made it easy to have uh, very adequate anticoagulation, very effective, and decrease the risk of uh, recurrence. So just to take you uh, through the journey of uh, anticoagulant uh, drugs. So they were, uh, you know, developed from leech, which is, this is uh, before, uh, you know, uh, this is the ancient times. They used uh, leech uh, for you know, some, you know, traditional uh, treatment because the saliva of the leech contain uh, herodine, herodine, which is, uh, which is anticoagulant uh, therapy. It's, it's still used, according to some of my uh, plastic surgery colleagues, it's still used uh, for to prevent graft uh, thrombosis, but not uh, commonly like uh, before. Then we have the heparin, which is the first anticoagulant about more than 100 years. Then we have another important, this is anaphylaxis heparin, another important milestone, BKA, more than 65 years. Then we have before 30 years, the loom liquid heparin. I think this is a very important milestone that, you know, changed, you know, uh, the paradigm of uh, VT treatment. Before that time, we treat, we tend to treat uh, VT as inpatient only because they require IV heparin infusion that require frequent monitoring of ABTT. With this, you know, uh, loma introduction of lumotiberine, we enabled us to manage VT as outpatient. Then we have the era of Duak, uh, which is the major revolution uh, in the history of uh, thrombosis. Really, this has changed the, changed the landscape of management of VTE. We have two important class, uh, direct thrombi inhibitor, like the Bigatran 2A inhibitor, and we have direct 10A inhibitor, like uh, Rivaroxaban, Abixaban, and uh, Udixaban. It's been in the clinical practice for more than uh, 10 years. As you notice that the older drugs, they are targeting multiple, you know, uh, key protein in the coagulation uh, pathway. And if you move on, so drugs are being uh, aimed uh, to target specific uh, single uh, target in the coagulation cascade, like you have 2A and you have uh, 10A, compared to the vitamin K antagonist like 2, 7, 9, 10, protein CS, I think what's the implication uh, for this targeted approach uh, versus uh, shotgun approach. Targeted approach has uh, a thick, excellent efficacy and safety profile. It decreases uh, the bleeding, and we have seen in the clinical trial there is a significant reduction in the major uh, bleeding, especially intracranial uh, hemorrhage compared to vitamin K antagonist. And uh, however, still some indication we need to use the shotgun approach uh, with vitamin K antagonist like for mechanical heart valve, uh, for antiphosphorylated syndrome, I think single, you know, 
uh, I mean, uh, direct or anticoagulant fail in this uh, indication. In addition to stability and insufficiency, we need to use, uh, I mean, uh, warfarin because the duocs are renally excreted. Uh, so what we are, when you talk about uh, duocs, so duocs versus noac, so uh, one introduced initially, we, uh, we used to call them novel oral anticoagulant. Then the name changed to new oral anticoagulant. Uh, then they are, uh, now we are using duocs. I think this is the most, uh, you know, uh, correct terminology because also we can use noac for non-vitamin K oral anticoagulant. I think when you use, I prefer to use duoc because the name is very meaningful. Duox, this is a class of oral anticoagulant that directly inhibit a single target, as the name. It's direct oral anticoagulant, a single target, and have similar cl uh, clinical, you know, uh, characteristics. Example, the big etran reverts, etc. So, uh, so ISTH, they recommend to use uh, Duox uh, rather than uh, to use uh, Nuox. So I, uh, I am, you know, starting, you know, to move from uh, Nuox to Duox. However, many people, they still call it uh, NUOX. So what's the advantage of uh, NUOX or DUOX over, uh, I mean, vitamin K antagonists? So the most important, uh, warfarin has unpredictable response, the, uh, whereas DUOX has very predictable response. So you get fixed dose and you get the, uh, I mean, the efficacy uh, endpoint. Narrow therapeutic index, uh, or neurotherapeutic window for uh, warfarin. If it is less than two, it, it is not effective. It's like placebo. If it is more than three, it's increased the risk of uh, hemorrhage. Uh, so this is very, you know, neurotherapeutic uh, window. Whereas the duox, they have wide uh, therapeutic window. Uh, the, this is important. Warfarin has slow onset uh, and slow offset action. The implication of this that you need to overlap them with rapidly acting anti-coagulant uh, like uh, LMWH or Fundabarinex or uh, IV heparin and, uh, for five days until the warfarin uh, kick uh, off. Also for, uh, I mean, slow offset, because if you stop warfarin, you need five days, uh, you know, uh, to INR to drift down to normal. This is important uh, for surgical Intervention. You need to bridge warfarin with the uh, long heparin. This duoc, it has very rapid onset and very rapid offset. So that's why this is make it easy. You don't need to overlap it with uh, rapidly acting anticoagulant. However, some approaches that I will gonna discuss later why they uh, use uh, injectable indication because there is some, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean uh, hypothesis or implication behind it. So routine coagulation monitoring, this is the most single, most important for warfarin, for INR. However, for DOAX, we don't need to monitor, uh, you know, uh, INR, and we don't need, need to monitor the uh, DOAX uh, level. Uh, because when we say monitoring, mean we quantitative measurement of the uh, drug effect and adjust the dose. Here, we don't need to adjust the dose. The dose is fixed. Only you adjust it for renal insufficiency or severe insufficiency. So you don't need to do this adjustment. There is no resistance, the dose fake, like warfarin, you can have, uh, you know, uh, some patients are very sensitive, like CYP2, C9, they require tiny dose, one or 0.5, and some patients, they are requiring 30, 40 milligram. They are resistant, like they have V-core uh, subunit, this is, uh, they are resistant to warfarin. The numerous drug-drug interaction, there is extensive list of drug-drug interaction. Yes, there is, some drug interaction with DOA, but much less than, uh, uh, you know, um, I mean, less than warfarin. So numerous food drug interaction, this is not existing with uh, DOA, but very significant for warfarin, especially uh, food uh, rich in uh, vitamin K, like uh, leafy vegetables. So that's why this is the idea for, uh, you know, uh, vitamin K antagonist. Uh, honestly, I lived the era of uh, vitamin K antagonist before 10 years. Then, you know, a transition to the uh, DOAC era, there is really significant, uh, you know, uh, change in the management of VT, more convenience uh, for patient uh, and for uh, physician. Our clinic before congested with uh, thrombosis patient, uh, they are queuing 
uh, waiting for INR for adjustment of warfarin, and they need to be seen every two, uh, some of them every two weeks, up to every uh, eight weeks. However, with Duox, now we can increase the interval up to uh, seven to eight months. You don't need to see this patient. So, really made significant change for us. So, what are the anticoagulation for? Uh, VTA treatment. So you have the conventional VTA treatment approach. We all we aware about it. So this is uh, overlapping approach with LMWH with warfarin for five uh, days until INR more than two. And you have to overlap for two days along with heparin uh, if the INR more than two. Then you need to stop uh, LMWH and continue uh, warfarin. For the other approach, we call it Debigatran uh, and Edexaban. We call it switching approach. Switching approach, you start with LMWH for five days, five to 11 days, then you switch to Debigatran or Eduxiban. The most important here, some physicians, uh, like resident, they confuse, they use uh, LMWH with Eduxiban or Debigatran. So this is very important. They should not be used concurrently. So it's a switching approach. You switch from low heparin to uh, Eduxiban. So this is some people, they say, uh, I mean, uh, most of the, uh, I mean, clinical trial for single drug approach, they have used pretreatment with lumotiparin for up to 48 hours. The, uh, the anticoagulant, I mean, the anti-inflammatory properties of lumotiparin, uh, LMWH has potent anti-inflammatory effect that can call the inflammation, uh, relieve the pain. Uh, and the swelling of uh, venous thermobolism. So that's why some, they have this rationale, I need to use uh, LMWH for five days then uh, to uh, switch to uh, DUOC. Even if this patient, this is the single drug approach, uh, you use from the initial presentation, Abixiban or Rivaroxiban. So they have different approaches, Rivaroxiban 15 milligram DID for three weeks, then you switch to 20, or Abixiban 10 milligram DID for one week, then uh, five milligram BID. This is, we call it single drug approach. So all, if you notice all approaches, so the most important, they hit hard, hit early, the first month. So you have to intensify the anticoagulation. It has its in intensified anticoagulation therapy because the highest risk of recurrence. Uh, so this is the, another uh, very nice, you know, uh, paragraph, uh, or sorry, uh, diagram. So when we say initiation, it's zero to seven days, then we have, seven to three months, we call it long term. Then more than uh, three months, we call it extended anticoagulation. So three months to indefinitely, because in other words, extended means it's lifelong. Uh, so, uh, I mean, extended anticoagulation, this is the terminology recommended by, uh, uh, I mean, ACCB and uh, ASH and ICTH. So uh, that's very important uh, to understand the concept, you know, when we go for extended and when we go for long-term anticoagulation. And remember the minimum duration for DBT is a three month. So I will take you, you know, uh, navigate you quickly through a journey of uh, a patient on uh, DUOC through different health care setting from the initial clinical presentation, uh, then the confirmatory, you know, uh, imaging, uh, then uh, we'll go for, does the patient require hospitalization or manage as outpatient? Uh, if the patient on anticoagulation and require elective surgery, what needs to be done? If the patient require dental intervention, uh, should we hold or we continue? If the patient coming to the clinic, should we monitor the, uh, I mean, uh, should we monitor some lab assay or we just, uh, just uh, use the routine lab like renal function test and CBC, and if the patient develops a complication, what needs to be done? I will move, uh, uh, I mean, fast, and I hope uh, the take of this journey is going to be uh, smooth. So this is the patient that presented with a typical uh, uh, patient, classic uh, patient is a 62-year-old male, post uh, high-risk surgery, uh, post hip fracture surgery. It was three weeks prior to the presentation given uh, VT prophylaxis only during hospitalization, but was not extended after discharge, he presented with painful left swelling, uh, uh, in addition uh, with uh, shortness of breath. So this is his uh, vital signs at initial presentation. He was tachycardic, 
uh, blood pressure maintained in the normal range, uh, oxygen saturation 88%, room air requiring 5 liters of oxygen to reach 98, and his weight 80. This is the lab uh, parameters. So there are some lab uh, parameter that can indicate this is a severe B. The troponin used as a prognostic factor. So uh, troponin is high, indicating this is, uh, there is RV strain. Also, uh, proponin B high, there is R RV strain. And by ECG, also there is some evidence of uh, RV uh, strain. So this is interesting that we don't see, uh, see it commonly. There is pulmonary infarction. We call it uh, hump to hump. This is like wood shaped obesity. And there is here in this lung, you can see there is compare right lung bronchitis to the left. There is what we call uh, uh, decreased vascularity, abrupt cut, cut off of vascularity. We call it post mark sign. CT done showed uh, filling defect. Uh, I can see that from the initial clinical, clinical presentation, the BE is going to be proximal. Uh, it's a proximal pulmonary embolism. So the patient, uh, we confirm it by CT per angiogram, which is the gold standard. This is what we have currently. It's 64 uh, multi-slice. See, this is really mimicking the invasive angiogram. We don't have invasive angiogram. We have CT pulmonary angiogram that really, uh, you know, very uh, sensitive to detect uh, segmental and subsegmental uh, pulmonary embolism. This is the double ultrasound showed echogenic thrombus and it is non-compressible. Uh, so this patient, uh, how uh, we treat this patient. So the recommendation, uh, home treatment for DVT and home treatment or air discharge for low risk PE. So we have to risk certify the pulmonary embolism. From 2016 guideline, we started you know, to treat uh, PE as outpatient, provided that it is a low risk. I will tell you on the next slide what does mean low risk. So basically with low risk PE and uh, whose home circumstances are adequate, we suggest treatment at home or air discharge over standard uh, discharge, like uh, we keep the patient 48 hours rather than uh, five uh, days. And this is the, what we have uh, simplified pulmonary embolism severity index. If you have any point of this, so gonna be uh, high uh, risk for outpatient uh, therapy and usually the 30 day mortality about 11%. Uh, if you don't have any point of this, going to be a low risk BE and the mortality about 1% and you can treat the patient as uh, out uh, patient. So this is very important uh, and very, this is a clinical dilemma, uh, whether we need to anticoagulate subsegmental B or not. This is very important. See, this is the pulmonary artery uh, main. You can have uh, then low bar, you can have interlow bar, you can have segmental and you have subsegmental. See, this is subsegmental, the small, uh, pulmonary embolism. So do we need to treat uh, subsequental BE uh, or not? Uh, the guideline they recommend that if you have, uh, I mean, subsegmental BE and no proximal DVT, so you have to do bilateral dubla and no proximal DVT in the leg and the patient have low risk for recurrent VTE. So they suggest, you know, clinical surveillance over anticoagulation. Uh, this is important, especially elderly patient uh, with multiple comorbidity, high risk for bleeding, and you discover during hospitalization, subsegmental B. I don't think anticoagulation will, you know, add benefit to the patient. It can, you know, uh, worsen the clinical situation. And I can use, I use metaphor like, you know, you are uh, cracking, you know, uh, not with the jackhammer. So the, uh, it has a devastating, you know, outcome. So this is very important. If the patient, different, you have a cancer patient, with subsegmental B, we know cancer it is high risk of recurrence. If you have antifacelibate syndrome, et cetera, so we need to, if you have somebody who's have very current VTE, so we need to anticoagulate. So it's a case by case basis, but very important. Subsegmental B, do bilateral doubler and check the bleeding and thrombosis uh, risk. Uh, if you have a patient like this is last week, we have a patient with uh, phlegmasia serolodolens. So this is phlegmasia serolodolens. We have extensive uh, DVT with embending venous gangrene. If we, uh, Luckily, alhamdulillah, we don't have common uh, presentation of DVT, phlegmasia, cerula dolens. Uh, for the 10 years, I have seen, uh, you know, two cases. So this patient, very critical to take the patient for catheter-directed thrombolysis by vascular surgery or interventional radiology for uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis or mechanical, you know, or pharmacomechanical like angiogit 
So very important after anti after the intervention, you should resume anticoagulation. It does not affect the duration. Duration is the same. If the DVT is unprovoked, the duration should be extended anticoagulation. If it is provoked, should be used for three months. So we don't recommend for routine, uh, I mean, catheter directly from lysis. It has to be, you know, uh, reserved for a severe clinical situation where you have impending venous gangrene. Uh, so if you have uh, massive VE, uh, like a BE with hemodynamic instability, low blood pressure, systemic pressure less than 90, you should give systemic thrombolysis. If you don't have massive BE, like an operation, so the anti-combination is the main state of therapy, but you have to, you know, observe the patient for clinical deterioration. If they deteriorate, you can use what we call rescue, rescue thrombolysis, or you can use catheter thrombolysis. So the guideline for the first vaccine is to work over the game, so the calculation would be DPP. So the first line is do work over, I mean, vitamin K antagonist, except for conservation. This is 2016, except for conservation, they recommend to use long tabling. I think with the current guideline, we have the ASCO guideline. Uh, they recommend, uh, they are, uh, you know, putting the option uh, long tabling, or you can use DUOC. So uh, the same, you know, uh, they have the same, uh, you know, weight. But this is 2016, that's why medicine is dynamic and we have to update ourselves. So what are property of ideal anticoagulant? So this is all we have. We have parenteral and we have oral. I think the oral is the most convenient for patients. So we need a drug that's oral, uh, like the DUOC, no significant food, uh, drug interaction, predictable response, no routine coagulation monitoring, fixed dosing, and no risk of This is all feature, you know, with the DUOC anticoagulant therapy. Very important how to switch from DUOC to warfarin. Very important if the patient on warfarin, so you have different guidelines. If the INR 2.5 or less, you can switch to, uh, I mean, uh, DUOC. Uh, some, they say less than two, you should switch to DUOC. I, myself, and yeah, personally, if the INR less than 2.5, I switch the patient to uh, DUOC. If the parental anticoagulant, you switch from enoxaparin to DUOC. So the next dose uh, for, uh, I mean, long tiberine, the patient can be given uh, DUOC. Um, that's it. Sometimes we use DUOC as uh, bridging, you know, therapy like a patient coming just naive. He, he was not started on uh, DUOC or vitamin K antagonists before. You can start uh, DUOC for five days with warfarin until you reach therapeutic INR. This has been done also in the clinical uh, practice. Um, so important to ensure uh, education uh, compliance with DUOC intake. They are not, they don't have uh, long half-life, like uh, vitamin K antagonist warfarin. The half-life, I think, about uh, 48 hours, 52 hours, if I'm not mistaken. Here, the half-life about 12 hours. So this is important uh, if the patient stop intake of uh, drug for one day, the effect is gone completely. So uh, so we don't recommend to use drug for somebody who is not compliant. So I think if you explain to the patient, educate the patient very well with, uh, you know, patient education and uh, leaflet and instruction at the initiation, uh, you know, of DUOC, they're going to be compliant with the DUOC. I always involve family member with the patient, especially for elderly patient, uh, to enforce uh, the message. Uh, so DUOCs are renal dysfunction, important. They are all renally executed with variability, like the bigger run is the most renally executed. Then you have apixiban 27 executed, adoxiban 50%, and rifoxiban uh, 35%. You have to, very important, if you initiate work, you have to measure the renal uh, clearance or creatinine clearance, and you have to measure creatinine. Uh, the, in the clinic, usually the guideline, if you have normal renal function, like uh, creatinine clearance more than 60, you check renal function every year. I do it in our clinic because we do see them in every seven months. Uh, six months, we do for them renal function, liver function, I do CBC for these patients. Maybe not evidence based, but this is what's been done in the clinical part. Believe me, if you see the patient after seven months without any lab, patient will not be happy with the clinic visit. Say, oh, doctor, I didn't do anything, okay? I need to uh, check my labs to make sure I'm fine or not. Uh, contraindications, you have to be aware about contraindication of uh, DOAC, if you have severe insufficiency, 
so uh, you have less than 30 and some less than uh, 15 active clinically significant bleeding concurrent treatment uh, with any other anticoagulant so don't use combined work with other anticoagulant like clomoctiverin or warfarin together uh, concurrent treatment with any big like routine inhibitor or prosthetic heart valves requiring anticoagulant treatment or antiphospholipid uh, syndrome these are the important uh, drug that interact and doctora uh, Farja already she demonstrated with anti TB medication, antiviral medication, especially in the uh, COVID 19 pandemia. So we have in Devonir, uh, in Denavir, uh, it's uh, used in the Calitra, okay, in Denavir and Ritonavir. Uh, so we should, if the patient admitted with ADUAC, on DUAC admitted, you show, and the patient started on antiretroviral therapy, like triple therapy, you should be switched to lomotiparine. This is very important. Antifungal drug also have significant interaction. See, this is the anti-TB rifampicin. Uh, it has interaction with, um, I mean, with the DUAC. With food, uh, I'm really not, you know, uh, aware about edoxiban. I think edoxiban, like abixiban, have no, uh, you know, uh, nothing to be, uh, you know, uh, to take with or without food. Uh, but for Rivaroxaban, interesting that you, to enhance the absorption, it must be taken with the meal or after the meal immediately. It enhances the absorption of uh, Rivaroxaban. And also Debigatran, usually Debig uh, Debigatran take with or without food, and they had high uh, fat meal delay, you know, uh, time to reach to the uh, peak. So uh, duration of treatment, provoked treatment, VTE for three months, and provoked extended I more than uh, three months. Like uh, if you have cancer, as Dr. Iman, uh, you know, eluded that cancer we treat usually for six months. If the cancer is uncured, uh, it can be extended uh, to 12 months or, or extended anticoagulation. Uh, uh, so very important if the patient has unprovoked VTE uh, and you treat for extended anticoagulation in the clinic, uh, you have to monitor for bleeding. If the patient having uh, high bleeding risk, this is there is ACCB uh, criteria for high bleeding risk. You should stop anticoagulation even if it is unprovoked because the risk is outweighing the benefit. Important, you know, cessation before uh, blunt surgery. Very very simple. The role if you have uh, standard risk bleeding, like for example, and this could be hernia repair, appendectomy. You stop 24 hour before and you resume 24 hour after. If you have high uh, risk uh, bleeding like orthopedic surgery vascular 48 hour before and 48 hour uh, you know uh, after uh, surgery so this is just a rule of thumb this is the classic uh, classification for high risk surgery uh, high uh, risk and uh, low risk usually high risk is like the two day risk uh, major bleeding to 4 percent and the low risk about zero to two percent uh, so for dental intervention very important, dental uh, dermatology intervention, uh, cataract, you don't need to stop anticoagulation, but very important, you have to do the procedure, like dental procedure in the trough level, not in the peak. Trough level, like the patient take the drug, uh, let's say, uh, take it every day, uh, eight morning, and next day, uh, you know, before the dental intervention, I recommend not to take it. Uh, eight morning if the dental intervention is say nine, he just postpone it after the dental intervention. So avoid the peak, just do it in the trough level. This is the guidance by, you know, uh, European uh, heart uh, rhythm uh, group. Uh, and uh, do we need to monitor? We don't need to monitor. Uh, so there is difference between routine monitoring of coagulation and quantitative measurement. So we need to have quantitative measurement if you have serious bleeding, Urgent surgery, this is a very important urgent surgery, renal or hepatic insufficiency, potential drug, drug interaction, like the case uh, presented by uh, Dr. Forge that uh, TB, anti TB medication, you can uh, you know, measure the drug effect and suspect it over uh, dosing. So these are how we monitor these drugs like uh, Debigatran, carry clotting time for Abixiban, Eduxiban, and Rivaroxiban, chromogenic anti uh, 10A assays. Very practical INR, if you have INR, just today I was consulted patient on Rivaroxaban, INR is high. So INR in the setting of Rivaroxaban use is sham INR, false INR elevation. Uh, because a thermoblastin reagent is calibrated for warfarin, 
in the INR and not for uh, DUOX. Uh, if the patient having bleeding, just to have follow this algorithmic approach, uh, whether it is mild, moderate, or life-threatening bleeding. So as uh, the case that uh, intercranial hemorrhage is major bleeding, so you have to consider protrombin complex concentrate and antidote. We have the antidote available for uh, uh, dabigatran, uh, idarosizumab, and we have for direct 10 inhibitor, abixaban and uh, rivaroxaban. Uh, and Edoxaban, we have Andexanet Alpha, which was approved uh, last year for reversal of direct 10A inhibitor. And uh, in this, you know, uh, COVID, uh, you know, uh, pandemia, so, uh, oh, I mean, ISTIS guideline released, uh, you know, this is Duoct and newer, let's say, hemophilia therapy. So they recommend to consider this crisis as an opportunity to switch patient receiving vitamin K antagonists to Duoct as long as it is within the indication. I mean, if it is not, we have to make sure it is not anti syndrome, it's not mechanical heart valve. Now it can be used uh, for cancer shift thrombosis as Dr. Ayman presented. Uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, overwhelming data about the use of duox in cancer shift thrombosis. And very important, you have to exercise ex uh, extreme caution uh, if you use duox in patient taking uh, antiviral uh, therapy. So very important you switch them to long heparin, but upon discharge, you have to resume DUOX. So DUOX are certainly of more practical use than uh, VK, especially during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. They don't need lab monitoring, remember the INR monitoring exposed the patient to the risk of, also there is a very important point here that also they consider DUOX for indication like unusual site thrombosis, like cerebral vein thrombosis, uh, because of, uh, this is, uh, uh, I said, was uh, the advantage uh, for a patient. So I hope uh, with my uh, presentation, uh, really the uh, patient journey uh, on uh, drug uh, therapy is safer and, and uh, we have safe uh, landing you know of our patient without any complication thank you very much uh, thank you so much dr muhammad for this very comprehensive uh, presentation regarding the journey of the patients on doac and now the floor is open for any question of dr farja or dr iman have any question to dr muhammad um, thank you a lot, uh, Dr. Sheep, for the presentation. Very comprehensive, actually. Just my question regarding COVID-19. Um, and I had, uh, as you know, it's all expert opinion now, the recommendation. It is not based on any uh, high-quality data. Um, and I had a problem when I start to put uh, our recommendation for anticoagulation for COVID-19 protocol. Uh, which one to start uh, and again the most uh, uh, challenging for me was to, to look at the, some of the drug drug interaction as you mentioned some of these drugs they interact even with low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated and they cause cardiovascular disease and uh, CVA uh, it was really uh, I wasn't sure I make it open all the anticoagulations and depend on the antiviral they are going to use. They need to choose also the type of anticoagulation, DUX, uh, for example. And the recommendation for DUX, we are not sure. Uh, if we look at the MOH, they put it based on D dimer when it's more than one. And uh, they call it intermediate prophylaxis recommendation. If the patient seems to be moderate risk, then uh, they will give intermediate prophylaxis. I'm not sure based on what they use it, MOH, if you have any idea why they use the intermediate prophylaxis. Also, the full uh, recommendation of full therapeutic, the MOH, they recommend it when it's high risk patient, they can give full therapeutic. Although nothing to support it, in going now, there is almost uh, six clinical trials in going to test the efficacy with safety of giving full therapeutic. Uh, our center are involved also, full therapeutic versus prophylaxis, regular prophylaxis, nothing called intermediate prophylaxis. Uh, if you can add anything, Dr. Sheep, about 
this recommendation from the MOH. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farja, for uh, pointing out to this complex, you know, uh, uh, issue. Uh, uh, PT prophylaxis for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Uh, so for, uh, there is OMOH protocol, uh, and we have our own protocol, uh, cluster two or KFMC protocol. Uh, for uh, thermoprophylaxis for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And I don't know, Dr. Farja, uh, which protocol you are using, MOH or your own protocol. So I will talk about our, uh, I mean, the idea behind, so, uh, I mean, uh, intensification of thermoprophylaxis. This is the difference between uh, thermoprophylaxis for COVID-19 and the routine thermoprophylaxis for hospitalized patients. All hospitalized COVID-19 patients must be activated prophylaxis. Then you have to intensify or upgrade from standard intensity prophylaxis to intermediate. If you have D-dimer more than one, this is much. What we use in our hospital, higher cutoff. If it is more than three, we uh, upgrade to uh, you know intermediate in intensity. Like if taking 40 in exabarium, we give it 40 BID. Then for ICU patients, it is the highest risk patient who have cytokine storm syndrome, they have ARDA, uh, very stormy course. Uh, such patient, we uh, recommend for therapeutic anticoagulation, not any patient, if the D-dimer more than three, if the patient have high sick, uh, I mean sepsis, uh, I mean uh, sepsis induced coagulopathy, uh, we call it sick uh, criteria, if they have digital gangrene, if they have high oxygen requirement, so putting strict criteria, not generous, to just use therapeutic anticoagulation. Because as you mentioned, I mean, clinical trials are their way to test the efficacy and safety of therapeutic anticoagulation population. Nobody knows what's the right answer. I think the MOH, what they are doing, it's very complex protocol. It is a copy and based on NHS protocol. If you go to NHS protocol, it's a group of clinical pharmacists by MOH. Yeah. Uh, uh, our resident really confused before we introduce our prophylaxis protocol. They are really confused about want to go for, uh, I mean, want to intensify to intermediate, want to the right answer. Uh, it's, it's case case by case basis, but COVID-19 patients are hypercoagulable uh, due to severe inflammation, and they are the, the, the higher, the, the more severe inflammation uh, coagulation. So I don't use DUAC prophylaxis. Uh, we use DUAC, uh, we use uh, lomotiberin or fontabarinic or anofrachibarin, then we are putting these with DUAC if the risk of, if they have high risk for uh, uh, it's like they have a yes. uh, risk as model, like what you use Cabrini or some use hmm. Bro, MOH protocol. It is a mixed, uh, it's a blend of many protocols. We put yeah. it together. Yeah. And, uh, and I looked at it in uh, our university. So what, what's your protocol, Dr. Mafar? I'm more in favor of your protocol than the MOH. We, hmm. we gathered and because I'm not sure when the dimer of more than one, what is it? Uh, what's the significance of it? Uh, all the clinical trials, we are involved in Canadian trials, and they use the cutoff more than twice or three. Um, uh, so we are using uh, this intermediate. Uh, uh, yani it was a pressure to put something called intermediate prophylaxis. Uh, the full therapeutic dose, and I give it only um, in very yes. restricted criteria, as you mentioned. Um, whereas it's uh, in a case of life saving, even if he's in the yeah. ICU, I will not give him full therapeutic unless there is any suggestion there is sudden deterioration, oxygenation, right strain, then I will give him full therapeutic. But this is our protocol, actually. 
because mm -hmm. the MOH is very confused, so. it's not helpful. Uh, I'm not sure based on what. Yeah, sure, this is what we use now. Okay. Yeah, and even uh, and I contact ah. someone and I ask him who who this did trial, this protocol. The Canadian trial. Uh, mm, mm. I don't know about it. The clinical trials. Dr. Muhammad. Yeah, the clinical trial. We are still yeah. الصوت عندك الميكروفون في شيء كده كان تنل الصوت مش واضح دكتور محمد استاذ حضرتك نقفل الكاميرا ممكن تحسن الصوت انا الصوت اقول اوكي اوكي تفضل دكتور محمد دكتور محمد ايوه الان واضح كده واضح شويه تفضل حضرتك دكتور محمد يو ميوتد ذا مايك اكشولي الان تمام كده الان تمام تمام تفضل تفضل اي اي دونت هاف انيثينج تو سي يعني ثانك يو دكتور فور الفور صوت مش واضح صوت مش واضح طيب I'll move forward with my presentation. Inshallah, it will be too fast. Uh, I'll not take uh, a long time.